Hi everybody, my name is Jerry Wise and I'm a life and relationship coach and I use a family systems approach to help my clients to achieve greater calmness, less codependency, less reactivity, helping them growing themselves up, reducing trauma and the impact of unhealthy relationships on their emotional system inside. And I do use and train them and coach them to reduce their anxiety and their reactivity and learning to stay calm. This video is entitled, Calmness is Everything. And I really believe that's true. And I remember when I was learning about family systems, particularly Murray Bowen family systems. And I was pastoring at the time and had lots of anxiety all the time. I was a very severe codependent, very anxious. Um, I had had um, my own issues from my own childhood and all kinds of things happening. And so all I found myself doing was being pinged and pinging others and so I would always have this uh, increase in anxiety and a lack of calmness. And that lack of calmness would also cause great reactivity. And then I would be reactive and make moves that fit into the dysfunctional system. But it didn't change the system. It just fit into the system. And that's what systems anxiety does. And I'm going to talk more about systems anxiety in a minute. Um, because it will mislead us, misguide us. It will send us to the places that are not really us. Just so that we can either go along to get along. Or get reactive and blow out. Or over function or under function. We do all these different dysfunctional behaviors because of the systems anxiety that we haven't looked at we don't see it seems very normal to us it's our normal and so it's not something that we're readily uh it's visual or or uh, clear to us and this video is about reducing systems anxiety recognizing it reducing it doing things that will help us be more calm within relationship systems. I realize there's an individualistic approach, which is if I'm feeling anxious, I need to do yoga, take Xanax, uh, you know, do meditation, prayer, um, breathing exercises. All those things are good things to do. There's nothing wrong with those. They can be very helpful. However, they don't fix systems anxiety because that requires a systems view of what's going on. And if we don't have that, then what we're going to have is this anxiety without the context. I realize also there's biochemical anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, things like that, and they need to be treated. Those are biochemical, those are genetically passed on, those are medical issues. We need to have those treated. Um, but even systems anxiety affects generalized anxiety disorder. Even if you have panic attacks, your systems anxiety is going to push your anxiety attacks more. So we want to deal with, and this video is dealing with and talking about systems anxiety that acts within us. It's the electrical charge that's going through all of our family of origin into us, our family of origin that's in us, and it's all operating all the time and will the rest of our lives. If we don't do anything about it, we will continue the norm from our family of origin and that family before that and that family generation before that. If we begin to look at it and focus on it, we can then begin to change what we transmit down through the generations and also be able to start operating outside that systems anxiety or that systems current that's always pinging throughout uh, our lives. So again, I'm not against anything. I think anything that helps, I'm for. 
but I really want people to think about systems anxiety. That's more what I'm, you see a doctor for a psychiatrist for anxiety disorders. You see a system specialist to help you with that. And some of the sp system specialists that are out there are like uh, Brene Brown, uh, Harriet Lerner, Roberta Gilbert, Jenny Brown, uh, Andrea Shera. Those are some of the uh, systems specialists. Even Jan John Bradshaw was kind of along that direction. Um, and, but these kinds of books really do help us see how the family operates in us and still operates in us through that electrical charge, which is that emotional field that we live in and that's always operating at all times. Um, if we don't look at systems anxiety, if we don't look at that to try to become more calm, then we will always be pinging and reactive and will deal with life in very unstable and reactive ways, which will only create more anxiety and pass that down through the generations. So if you really want to start stopping that dysfunctional pattern, and certainly I believe it's a very good, uh, if, if your father's an alcoholic and mother's an alcoholic and you become an alcoholic and you get into recovery, and stay in recovery for the rest of your life, then you're passing on to your children, maybe the DNA for alcoholism, but you're not passing on the system's anxiety which comes with alcoholism. And that can make a big difference for the next generation. So making a change and being in recovery can really help future generations as well as yourself. Because if you're drinking and actively drinking, you're pinging all over the place. Uh, because your life is falling apart, you're making bad decisions, you're having systems anxiety, you're having your own anxiety, real anxiety, and then you go drink, and then it becomes a bigger problem, and then we're just pinging all over the place. And then we wonder, why don't our lives work? Uh, same way with like adult children of alcoholics or adult children of narcissists. They have so much of that system's anxiety or the carryover from the trauma and all of the normalcy that was for, with them growing up that they end up pinging and getting reactive. And then we don't change anything. We're just reacting to everything. We don't change ourselves. We only usually cause more problems and it becomes more unstable. Um, and our chronic systems anxiety and our justified reactivity because our reactivity seems very justifiable because of how what we don't see that's the ocean we swim in and as a matter of fact I'm lucky enough the ocean is right there over my left shoulder and maybe at the end of the video I might give you just a little tour of some a beautiful spot here that uh, has the ocean and maybe it would be calming for you um, <clears throat> and what we experience in that kind of reactivity and the, the level of systems anxiety we have is normal to us. This inherited family of origin, chronic anxiety, is at the root of most of our problems, believe it or not. Our conflicts, our bad decisions, our codependency, our addictions, it will affect everything. Our, our job career, our job choices, our marital choices. Oftentimes we get married because of what's going on inside of us. And again, that whole um, uh, attraction, the law of attraction. Well, the law of attraction is your system's anxiety and their system's anxiety finding each other. That's that law of attraction. Let me give you an example of Brian and Serena. Brian and Serena are a couple that I worked with long ago. And uh, she's very codependent, feels guilty. Uh, her mother and parents are very intrusive. Her sister's pretty narcissistic and, and they're all enmeshed as a family. And she's a part of that enmeshment. She then marries Brian. Brian's not as enmeshed with her family because that's not his family. 
Well, they don't like that, and that feels very uncomfortable because he's the odd man out, and he's taking Serena away from us emotionally. We don't want her to make choices apart from what we're doing as a family. We want to do that all together. So you guys need to come over and spend all weekend with us. And if you don't, why don't you love your parents? Why don't you get along with your sister? There's that kind of guilt that happens. So anyway, they're working on their marriage because they've had marriage problems and difficulties. By the way, Brian grew up in an alcoholic home, was demeaned and traumatized by his grandfather who cared for him often while his dad was drinking, grandfather. Would, but he was very uh, disrespectful, demeaning to him as a kid in which he felt worthless. She feels guilty, anxious, nervous, uh, and worried. That all comes from her family of origin. Now we have a real situation in their marriage. So dad's going to get, um, and it's a pretty dysfunctional family that she has, and pretty negative. Dad's going to have his uh, 80th birthday. So we want you all come for four days and be with us, which Brian hates because the family is very dysfunctional. The wife doesn't like it, but she feels forced or pushed to do it because she ought to and that that would keep mom dad sister brother everybody calm down if she shows up so they decide together we're going to just spend two days rather than four that's a good compromise for us we're still going to zadie's birthday no problem but dad is kind of out of it he doesn't care he's 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 a mess also so it, we're not talking about a normal, nice family. We're talking about a very dysfunctional family on both sides. So she says, okay, because we've had these marital difficulties, I'll choose two days rather than four, and that will be a plus to Brian, which it was. And he felt great that she had made this decision. Now her sister calls her and says, you're only doing two days, not four? This is your dad's 80th birthday. What is wrong with you, Serena? And then she starts doubting herself because now she has her sister pinging her out of this anxiety to enmesh that you need to come and be a part of us. Why are you doing just this two-day thing? You know we want you here for all four days, etc. So then she starts wavering a bit and just shares her wavering with Brian. Well, Brian, I've just been thinking about that two days, and, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe, you know, I've just, I talked to my sister, and she was giving me all kinds of heck, and I feel uncomfortable with just standing with that two days, but I haven't just, you know, I'm not saying we should go for four, but I just don't know. Then, what happens with Brian? He erupts and goes, well, I just feel worthless. I don't feel special at all by you. Um, and, and I feel demeaned and disrespected. And, you know, why don't you ever choose me over your family? By the way, she was just wavering because of her family system issues, and which were very realistic. But he's now erupting in e reactivity because he feels hurt, because she's not making him a priority. Uh, she now feels hurt because he's angry. She can't calm him down. She's upset that he won't even listen to her. And now they're not talking to each other. And that's what happens. Now, what, what's the problem? The number of days. The wavering on the number of days. Um, the conflict. The argument the words that were spoken in anger or frustration, uh, the cutoff and pouting, uh, which problem shall we address? And what I think of is, in some ways, none of those. Because that's not a deep enough root for where, what all this is happening. All this is symptomatic of what's wrong. That's just the symptoms on the top. The problem is her enmeshment and pressure coming from her family and her continued enmeshment with them 
and Brian's enmeshment with his grandfather and alcoholic father and the continued messages that he's worthless, he's no good, he can't be loved, he's not special. That's where the problem is and in that system it creates a lot of anxiety and then we erupt and then we're reactive and now we have these marital problems. Now I could teach them how to manage their anger, I could teach them how to uh, be more respectful, I could teach them how to see that their hurt is unrealistic, I could, I can do all those kinds of things but I'm still not touching the core of the emotional field which is how they're tied to their family of origin still and how it flows over into their marriage because actually the problem's not dad's birthday the problem's not four days or two days the problem's not any of that that's not the real problem the problem is their reactivity and pinging and insecurity because of the place that they are still functioning in their family of origin. He's still functioning as the demeaned and verbally abused child. She's still functioning as the guilt-ridden, you need to perform to get our acceptance and love child in the family. She's still acting that way, though she's an adult. You know, she's 40, he's 41. So it doesn't matter what age, we're still functioning in that way. And so if we can deal with that functioning, you'd be surprised how many conflicts, reactivity, and problems can be reduced and we become more calm. But we do have to be, work on that calmness. If you want to become less reactive and more calm, deal with the practice recovery operating in operating outside the family of origin anxiety. And, what I, and that means resolving that enmeshment, resolving that trauma that you had. And, and you want to act outside of it. You want to react out or respond outside of it. Because if you're responding inside of it, you're just gonna ping all over the place for the rest of your life. It's just gonna keep pinging. And so, Again, as I've said, I know there are like three types of anxiety. There's real anxiety, there's biochemical anxiety, and then there's systems anxiety. If someone puts a gun to my head, I have real anxiety. I have fight or flight that's very realistic and very rational. Though it becomes irrational, but when you got a gun to your head, you know, you're going to have that. Then there's biochemical anxiety, which anxiety disorders do exist that are biochemical. The brain's not working quite right, just like your kidney, liver, heart, skin. We have all kinds of imperfections and blips and problems. Well, your brain has the same thing. We can have little blips and problems and, and biochemical anxiety or biochemical uh, problems. And then lastly, systems anxiety which is not real anxiety, it's anxiety from the system. Though it feels very real to us, but it's actually the system that's creating that anxiety and my place in the system. Remember, the greater calmness, the lower reactivity will be. The more self-directed, the more self-differentiated, the more present and clear-headed you will be and intentional. Uh, and then we can, uh, ver the more intentional we will be versus being reactive and neurotic. And neurotic is the kind of Freudian term for systems anxiety. Neurotic is acting, feeling out of your past because we're acting and feeling out of our past is what we're doing. And we want to learn to live outside our past, not deny it, not deny it whatsoever. Recover from it, see it, and operate outside of it. And I think that's what Family Systems helps us do. And as you read the books, and I'm going to give you authors and books, I think you'll see that's what they're talking about. 
well, how do I live? How do I get outside my family of origin, you know, uh, perspective? Um, let's talk about uh, how how because of the fam because of the family emotional anxiety system uh, that we have operating through us all the time, even to the present. Um, I'm going to go home now and confront my parents about my abuse or their narcissism. Now, I've talked in other videos about don't go home and drop the bomb. Don't go home and confront your parents until you don't need to. Then confront them. The best time to confront parents about the bad things they have done is when you don't need to do it anymore. Then you can confront them. Sounds crazy, but if you don't, you will operate right inside the family system and you'll be pinged all over everywhere. And so if I'm going to go home and I'm going to confront my parents about their narcissism and how they treat me, I've just jumped into an emotional 747 and I've jumped into the pilot seat and I haven't even learned how to fly a Cessna uh, and I haven't even read any books on how to fly a plane. Well, guess what's going to happen when you do that, when you jump into that 747? It's going to crash. It's going to, who knows where it's going to go. You can't navigate it. You don't know where you are. You don't know where the land is. You're, you're lost. But so many people think out of their unawareness that I can just go confront them and they'll behave better and they'll treat me better and they'll respect me more if I do that. No, it will become a reactivity fest, a total reactivity fest of everybody, brothers and sisters. I have clients who have tried to work better with their narcissistic mother. He and her, his wife, her, his narcissistic mother is just so clueless and non-empathetic. But then his brother and father are mad and angry at him because he's addressing his mother's uh, and distancing in an appropriate way and putting up boundaries with his mother and his wife and child. And now they're all upset. So if we have to see how everybody is going to be operating before we start to fly that plane, let's learn how to fly that plane. To begin to learn how to pilot that plane, we begin to read the books by Harriet Lerner, Roberta Gilbert, Jenny Brown, um, and and these folks, and Brene Brown, etc. Then we're beginning to learn to pilot this plane of us. And we can also manage it and pilot it through difficult weather. Because I'll tell you, when you start dealing with this system's anxiety, you really need to have a map, you really need to be able to navigate, and you need to be able to regulate yourself. We can learn how to do that. If I can do it, anybody can do it. I know it may seem like, well, Jerry, you've done a lot of learning. Yes, I have done a lot of learning and, and reading and changing. But what I'm asking you to do is no different than what I have to do, no different than what Murray Bowen has to do, no different than what Brene Brown has to do or Harriet Lerner. It doesn't matter. We all got to do the same thing if we're going to grow up and if we're going to be ourselves and have less anxiety. I never in my life, uh, probably, what, 40 years ago, at that time I never in my life thought I could feel this calm about relationships, about how to operate within them. Never in a million years I, said, I would say you are crazy. That's never going to happen. I don't even know what you're talking about is what I probably would have said. Let me read a quote by Andrea Shera. In her book, Your Mindful Compass, and again, I would suggest reading Jenny Brown, Growing Yourself Up first, then Andrea Shera, Your Mindful Compass second. And she writes, by organizing the felt anxiety about others to focus on what self can do for self, the anxiety comes down and people become or we become more realistic and and if you can deal with reality and become more realistic you will bring down the system's anxiety bring down the reactivity 
Now, who wants to deal with reality? Well, most of us don't. I, denial's fine with me. I don't want to see, I don't want my fantasy and childhood fantasies and dreams to go away. I'm no different than you. I, I want to have a perfect parent. I want to have family that loves me. I want to have, you know, wife, husband who loves me and cares about me and family and, you know, a great job and the boss treats me right. I, I want all those things. And, um, and I will dream and fantasize about them. It's not that we cannot achieve happiness. We just can't achieve happiness from all the external making us happy. And that's where we have to shift. The calmness comes when we focus on us rather than getting it from everywhere out there. That's the hard message and that's really difficult. Because people don't like that, and they don't like that message. It is a road less traveled, you know, and not everybody wants to do it. Not Therapists don't even want to do it. I've trained therapists for years. Therapists don't want to do it either. And if they don't, then I see how limited they're going to be in their practice. Because then they're going to be telling people to do stuff they haven't done. The best way to be a therapist is you're helping people do what you have done. Now, it doesn't mean I've lived all of my clients' lives and every problem they've experienced. I haven't. But I know what reducing anxiety is in the midst of a dysfunctional or difficult family. I know what being a self when it's scary and hard to do. I, you know, I know what those experiences are like, and that's no different for them too. Uh, we do share the same growing up process. We all have to grow up, and it's not fun. It, it, but it will reap calmness, non-reactivity, and being able to be self-directed, self-focused, clearer, seeing things. Um, and then, then you're jumping for joy that, gosh, I did. I went up, I have a client, her mother, she's a nurse, she goes over to her mother, uh, her mother gives her a hard time, and then she comes back to me and says, Jerry, it didn't even bother me. Now, because she doesn't care? No, because she's learned to be calmer and learned to be herself and focus on herself, not her mom's dysfunction and letting it ping her, ping, ping. And so we can reduce that pinging. To change... One has to be able to reduce anxiety, the response to a real or imagined threat, and see the emotional system as it is. It's a natural force. This enables one to develop a less reactive and more differentiated self. And what I mean by that is this emotional field that has all this anxiety in it, and whenever you have two people you're going to have some emotional or systems anxiety at work between them. And so as long as we as two people can stay calm, then we can operate with each other. But as soon as that anxiety goes up, we then either enmesh or we cut off because we got to react to that anxiety. The ability to for you to not react to that anxiety will help keep you in place, even if this person is enmeshing or cutting off. It keeps you here, and that's a great skill to learn, which we'll talk more about. Um, also, this emotional field that I've been discussing, the emotional field is operating throughout your family of origin into you into your relationships, job, work, church, synagogue, m mosque, any, anywhere where you uh, have relationships. It's working in you all the time. And as I've said in other videos, your family of origin is still in you. What are you going to do about that? And, that? and if they go, nothing, or I don't believe that, then I'm going to go, well, good luck to you. You know, I hope you can navigate and fly the 747 without knowing how to fly. I, I hope it works. And, and maybe occasionally it does. Uh, but many times it will fail. This emotional field then gets tied right into our lizard brain and our lower limbic system. 
and it fires and then we feel and think and actually what we do is feel think we then feel and then have these thoughts the feelings seem normal the thoughts seem normal but what they are is a reaction to our lizard brain they're a reaction to that limbic system that's tied to the family of origin and and generations past i'm probably the and we are guesstimate i i'm probably my emotional field and emotional life is probably about five generations old. So all of the stuff that's come through the generations emotionally, I now have in here. So if you have a grandfather or great-grandfather who suicided, then you've got that oops, passing all the way down to you. At least the anxiety from it, the 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 fear and all kinds of things like that. Now we don't see that because I didn't know my great great grandfather. So I never met him. But don't think he has no effect on you. Intergeneration transmission of this emotional process is very powerful. Uh, but the good news is we can begin to learn to operate outside of it and be ourselves rather than just be a, in my case, it's Wise Wardwell, mom's maiden name Wardwell, my, the Wise Wardwell family system, or super self, that I operate in. I don't want to be a Wise Wardwell super self, part of that. I want to be me while connected to other people. That's what I want to be, and not pinged by all this Wise Wardwell stuff that I've been through. So I hope that's not too confusing. And I know, and the difficulty is, it's hard to describe something unseen in that way. I'm wanting to change your perspective so that you'll begin to think a little differently about how relationships operate. And I would, I would suggest you just keep listening to it and keep listening to it, keep reading the books. What I found is that people read, let's say, Jenny Brown's book, Growing Yourself Up, and then, a year later, after working with me for a year, they read her book and go, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe what I'm reading. I, now I understand what she's talking about. And so once it begins to become internalized for us, then we begin to see more. Uh, I remember reading books by Murray Bowen, uh, uh, kind of the grandfather of family therapy, and, and certainly the starter of family systems, the originator of family systems thinking. And again, how he did that was he brought in uh, schizophrenic patients, brought in their families, and treated them together, which you didn't do at that time, because in a Freudian model, you deal with the patient by themselves, not with their whole family or with the whole context. And he began to see how the schizophrenic symptoms would go up and down depending upon what the emotional field, the anxiety, the reactivity was happening within the family. If the family was more self-differentiated, less anxious, the symptoms went down. When it becomes more anxious, more the symptoms go up. And he's going, well, this is a biochemical illness. How does it get affected by what's going on here? Because there's a whole unseen emotional field that's happening. Soon as you walk in, you got a room full of people. Soon as you walk into that room, everybody's emotional field is activated, including yours. And you will act according and respond and react according to that emotional field. I want to deal with that emotional field so I can become more calm. Today I want to talk about some tools for doing that. That's kind of an explanation of the, of the system's understanding of calmness. Now let me talk about some practical things, because people are always like, well, just tell us what the tools are, Jerry. Well, I can tell you what the tools are, but if you don't have the overall understanding, the tools don't make quite as much sense. Now, it can be helpful to just hear the tool, and then it begins to change your brain, and begins to mess with your head and you go, what well, you know, he just said this, you know, what, what would it, what would happen, it, and I've used this example of what would Betty do in my videos. And what would Betty do is a tool to be able to step outside 
the family's emotional system. I'm now, I now have to go uh, have lunch with my mother, let's say, and I feel very anxious, very upset. I, who knows what she's going to say. She's very intrusive. She's self-centered, blah, 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 whatever. And I'm using this example. And, and I'm going, Jerry, you know, I'm asking Reggie. Let's say Reggie. Reggie would be a therapist that I had. And I would always go, what would Reggie do? That's another tool that I use. What would Reggie do right now? And my clients go, what would Jerry do? And that's okay. You can borrow my objectivity. I borrowed Reggie's. I borrowed Therana Nelson's. By, by the way, Therana Nelson is also another trainer in family systems. And I think she's head of a marriage and family therapy program at a university now. And she was at a university near me. She's written a couple books for therapists to help them use family systems approach. Therana Nelson. And so... I'd say, well, what would Therana do? It is a way to get out of your subjectivity that's all blinded by all this reactivity and anxiety and all this feeling stuff. So I'm going to go see mom and have lunch, and she's going to be herself. She's not going to change. And so I think, well, what would Betty do? Which is Betty's a neighbor, let's say. How would Betty relate and treat mom if she went to lunch now i understand mom might treat betty differently but it doesn't matter what would betty do is what i should do whether mom treats me the same way or doesn't treat me the same way and so you can say what would therana do what would reggie do well i would go and say okay mom i hear you're saying that i'd really rather not talk about that subject you know and i'd really rather not share that with you well, how are you and your wife doing? How is it? Well, I, I, we can talk about that another time. Hey, how have you been doing, Mom? That's what Betty would do because she wouldn't talk about her marriage with the neighbor and the intimate details of that. You'd say, well, that's your mom. No, that's my adult mom. That's not, that's not just my parent mom. That's not my mommy. That's my mo mother biochemically but not a parent anymore so she doesn't get all access to me all the time Th that's as a child and you say well mothers don't change uh, they may not i'm not even asking my mother to change i'm asking me to change in how i relate to her and so i think well what would betty do because that would be more objective as to what i should do now I start to feel a little more calmer and I go, oh, I think Betty would do this. She wouldn't put up with that. At that point, Betty might leave. At that point, she would stay calm and say, well, Mrs. Wise, um, you know, I'm not sure I want to talk about that, but we can talk about something else. Um, you know, she would be appropriate and keep mom in place. I can do the same thing. If mom doesn't reciprocate, that's on her. If I, get too, if I do get too frustrated or if she keeps continuing to do that, I can say, well, you know, I think our lunch is over. I'm going to go home and we'll meet again. Well, where are you going, Jerry? Well, I'm done for the day. I've, I've kind of done enough. You know, we've talked enough and uh, I will see you at another time. And, and that's what we want to learn to practice. Now, I'm sure you're sitting out there going, well, Jerry, that's not easy. Jerry, you're not telling me anything new. I know it's not easy. The only thing is you either work on doing that or you don't. And my concern is if you don't, you're just going to keep pinging for the rest of your life and you're going to keep being frustrated and you're going to keep wasting your emotions on not growing up. And I, you know, now, is it easy? Is it simple? No, it's not. It takes practice, but the practice is worthwhile, very worthwhile. And I'm going to, that's going to be one of our tools here in just a minute. So let's talk about a tool. A tool might be um, uh, 
like body work. And these are very helpful things for lowering anxiety. Body work, meditation, breathing, medication. These are individualistic approaches to reducing your anxiety. That's okay to do. Uh, and in fact, if someone's very, very traumatized, they may want to use some medication for a period of time to help them stay calm while they're growing up. And then they might be able to not use medication. Unless they have a biochemical problem, then they may have to continue. Uh, and I know even that, for many of you out there, that's very, oh no, I'd never use medication. Well, you don't have to. I'm not, you know, I make no money off medication. In fact, if you don't take medication, I'm more likely to make more money. So if you don't use medication, your therapist is going to have a windfall. Not that everybody should be on medication or everybody, they're just times and places where, and circumstances and people where that's appropriate, is all I'm saying. Not for everyone. So, we can use all of those methods, and uh, again, there are plenty of places you can go find for meditation, body work, uh, breathing exercises, uh, the heart, head uh, technique. Uh, I can't think of it right off the right off can't think of it um, but there's lots of things that you can use to help uh, calm yourself down second of all again calmness is practiced by learning to fly your plane and not others self-regulation um, and this is a systems tool again keep your focus on you what we tend to do is fly a plane. What we tend to do is fly a plane while trying to fly somebody else's plane. Well, that gets real confusing and real difficult. You have to keep the focus on you. When your anxiety goes up, we tend to switch the focus to the danger, the threat, the other, the parent, the narcissistic parent, the uh, disrespectful husband, the, you know, the mean adult child, the, you know, we switch our focus over to them. Now we're outside of ourselves again, and we need to stay focused on us and stay inside focused. What do I need to do? What should, how should I be responding? How do I need to be an adult in this situation without trying to change them. Now I understand if we're parents and we're talking about minor children and dependent children, well then we have more of a responsibility to help those children change. But that's still even limited, uh, but we have more. But when it's adult time, it's not my job to change you or make you better uh, in the relationship. Certainly I would give you advice if you're open to it, but I'm not going to try to change you to make me feel okay. That's not going to work. I'm not going to try to change those things outside of me so that I can feel all right. It just, it's not a practice that works at all and causes lots of problems. So again, one of the main focuses is when the anxiety goes up, when you're very anxious and you're not calm, Watch where your focus is. Not out there. Focus in here. And go, hmm, what do I need? What do I believe? What do I want? What, how do I see this situation? Not, what are they going to think when I share this? What are they going to feel when I do this? That's a focus on them. Don't focus on them. And that begins to give us some detachment and some neutrality. Again, not easy, but an important tool and skill that we want to learn. Uh, thirdly, observe, not absorb. And I've used that many times in the past. Uh, have you ever said or heard somebody say, well, what he is going through is just weighing so heavy on me. I feel so sad for her. I just feel so guilty uh, about my pitiful mom. All of those statements reflect me absorbing 
their feelings. Remember, they're their feelings, they're not your feelings. You give them their feelings and let them feel them. Stop feeling other people's feelings. If you're an empath, then it's a more of a challenge. I understand that. And I tend to be more of an empath, tend to be more codependent, so I'm, I can zero right in on your feelings and go, ah, and in they go. That's not going to help you. It's not going to help me. Me taking over and operating in your feelings is not going to help anybody. It's going to make it more reactive and more problematic. We tend to think, well, I'm being more sympathetic. I'm being more empathetic. No, no. You can be sympathetic and empathetic without owning and operating in someone else's feelings. It's one thing if someone comes and says, oh, my mother just passed away. Well, my mother has passed away. So I do feel for them and I understand, oh, that, that, that's really, really awful and difficult. And I'm so sorry to hear that but I'm not going to share their grief. They can share their grief with me. I very much care. And I know how difficult that is. I have my own grief. And I certainly wouldn't say, oh, well, go take your feeling somewhere else. I'm not saying that, but I'm not going to internalize your feelings. I'm not going to absorb them. Nope, not going to do it. And many times families, when we operate within our family, they'll want us to absorb their feelings, mirror their feelings. Just like Serena and her sister. Her sister was saying, oh, you're not staying for four days? What's wrong with you? This is dad's 80th birthday. I can't believe you're only going to stay two days. And Uncle Joe's coming at this time and blah, 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 and you're not going to... She goes through all that. What is her sister wanting Serena to do? absorb her systems and the family systems anxiety and feelings about don't you stop in meshing with us you need to be in meshing with us and you should feel the same way I do so start feeling my feelings right now Serena that's what's really being asked no nope, I'm not gonna feel the families or your feelings right now. I'm going to feel mine. I'm going to make a decision about whether I'm going to come two days or four days, and I'm going to do it in conjunction with my husband, who actually comes first over family of origin. If you don't make your spouse first, you'll, you'll as a couple, you'll be in to see me. You'll be in to see a therapist eventually. If you don't make your spouse first, it's going to be a problem. And so we don't want to absorb the feelings, we want to observe them. And just like the person coming up and saying they feel sad because their mother had died, I'm certainly going to uh, observe that. I'm gonna sit with them. And as a chaplain, I was a pastor, a chaplain, pastoral counselor, social worker, marriage and family therapist, I've done a lot of different jobs. And as a chaplain, I would go in and and I can't absorb their pain, particularly if someone's sitting in the hospital, they got cancer, they're probably gonna die. I'm gonna become overwhelmed if I take on their feelings. I won't be able to be much help to them at all. And certainly won't be a help to me, I'll be going home crying all day. That's not gonna help me or them. It's their challenge to face, I'll stand beside you and I'll care about you but I'm not going to absorb your problem or your feelings. I can't, I'm me. I've got my own problems and my own things I have to deal with. And so, but I can observe and I can be present and I can care. And again, if we can observe rather than absorb, then we're gonna stay out of the emotional family pinging. We're not gonna be as reactive. Um, Mom is just so upset because I don't want to go out to lunch with her on Sunday. She always wants me to go out on Sunday, and I want to have a Sunday for myself. I take on her upsetness, turn it into guilt and shame, and then I either end up going or I get reactive and mad and say, Mom, why do you always make me do these things? I just hate it when you, why are you in control of me? 
Both of those are enmeshment statements. Because I'm not observing, I'm absorbing. Rather than going, okay, what would Betty do? If Betty didn't want to go out to lunch, or if Reggie didn't want to go out with lunch with mom, who wants me to go out every Sunday, they would say to mom, mom, I just want to let you know ahead of time, I'm planning on not going out to lunch with you every Sunday. And I just want to let you know that. I know that might be disappointing to you. Um, and if she gets upset, then I use the upsetness uh, tool as well. And the upsetness tool is if mom goes, what do you mean you're not? You always go out with me on Sunday. I can't believe that you wouldn't go out with me. What kind of son does that? Mom, does it upset you that I'm not going out to lunch with you this Sunday? Yes, it does greatly. Well, Mom, it doesn't upset me. And, and, and I'm sorry that you're upset. That's very unfortunate. Um, and again, I can't own someone else's upsetness. I can only own mine. And I want to stay on my side of the tennis net, which we're also going to talk about too. Now, this uh, observing, not absorbing, can also feel like you're not caring. But that's not true. You're just not absorbing. You can still care. I care that mom's upset that I'm not going to go out to lunch with her. That's unfortunate. We've always done it. Now I want to make a change. <clears throat> She's upset about it. I understand that. That makes sense. I do care. But just because I care doesn't mean I'm going to go out to lunch on Sunday. I don't have to. I'm an adult. And I may have other plans and want to make other plans. I still respect her. I still treat her appropriately. That's what Betty would do. That's what Reggie would do. Rather than what would mom's little son Jerry do? I don't, we're always asking that question rather than what would Betty or Reggie do? What would mom's little son Jerry do? That's what we so often ask. And that's where we get into trouble. Fourthly, another tool is to, we want to resist uh, feeling our feelings. Now you're going, well, Everything in the books and everybody talks about you need to become more aware of your feelings. Yes, you do. Your real feelings. But I don't want you to become more aware of systems feelings. And I have a video on true feelings versus systems feelings that you might want to take a look at that video. Um, you're absolutely right. I don't want to um, uh, shut down real feelings, but I do want to resist systems feelings. And so I may need to shut down my feeling process. For example, if I know it's right for me to not go to lunch with mom Sunday, she's going to be upset and be critical, but I really don't want to do it. And if Reggie or Betty were doing it, they would not go and they would be polite and respectful. I'm going to do that. So to not get over flooded with feelings and such, I'm going to go and stay in my head the whole time I'm with mom. I'm just going to think. No feelings. Whatever feelings happens, I'm going to go, beep, forget them. Nope, I'm not, I'm not feeling them. I'm, I do not want to feel. I want to think. You can feel afterwards, but if you feel while you're doing it, you're going to be flying a 747 and it's going to be all over the place. Stop the feeling. Stop feeling. Uh, because that's why we stay in toxic relationships. Well, I can't leave my narcissistic abusive husband because, you know, I would feel so alone and I would feel so in pain and, and he would be unhappy. And how would that work out? With and I'm going, please resist all of those feelings. I know you would feel alone. I know, and we're going to work on those. But please, when you're working and operating with him, do not feel those feelings. Force yourself not to feel them. Stay out of your feeling process. Stay in your head process. Stay out of your feeling process. Because it's going to mislead you, and it's going to cause you to be reactive. And then you're going to end up staying anyway. So stay out of that feeling process. 
uh, focus on thinking and not that feel thinking that we do in which, which together feelings and thoughts just get bound. Systems anxiety, feelings, thinking, and then that's what comes out of our mouth and that's how we act. And we want to slow down and stop that process. Because feel think is is a real problem. That's your limbic system firing into your executive function and feeling your amygdala and all and firing into this system, and then you have the thoughts that match the pinging back here. I don't want to have the thoughts that match with that pinging. <clears throat> I don't want to feel those feelings <clears throat> that come from back there <clears throat> because I'm having a fight or flight reaction to something that doesn't deserve a flight or fight reaction. It's overly charged over anxiety. We're just talking about not going to lunch. We're talking about me as an adult choosing I don't want to live with this person. We're not talking about life or death. Now, I'm not saying in narcissistic situations it's not a mess and ugly and dangerous and can be, but, but that's a more extreme case. Um, and I do, <clears throat> I do tell people in my videos, take what you can use and leave the rest. People will write and say, well, Jerry, this doesn't apply to my situation. Well, then don't apply it to your situation. <clears throat> Remember, I'm talking to a wide audience people have of all kinds of experiences and it's hard to talk to everybody's experiences through the video which is why I do individual coaching to deal with your specific situation because not everything fits everybody's situation now I think all of these tools fit everybody's situation but not everybody's ready for those tools they could be misused they could cause more problems. And so if they might, or if it causes you too much anxiety, don't do it. You know, if you're doing it on your own, don't do it. Get a coach, a therapist to help you with that. So, um, so I understand that not everything I say fits for everybody. Because people say, well, my narcissist does. I know, you're, but these people over here don't have the same problem you have over there. Um, when we are overwhelmed or reactive, we are overloaded with feelings. We want to stop or block them or ignore reactive feelings. Reactivity is that chronic anxiety at work. <clears throat> That's when you know the chronic anxiety is at work, when you have those reactivity feelings. So when you are reactive, just remember, there's a bigger system at work in you right now. It's not just the symptom of the problem you're dealing with this moment. It's a whole bunch of stuff and a whole relationship system you're in that you're being reactive. So that's a clue. When I get reactive, I start going, systems feelings, systems feelings. I'm reactive, I'm reactive. Fifthly, the tennis court map, using a tennis court. I like using a tennis court map. I played tennis poorly when I was in high school and in junior high, and, uh, but I like tennis. And I always think of this tennis court example of how can I view my relationships in a way that I know when, when are boundaries being crossed, when is it more healthy? Can I use this analogy to kind of understand what's going on between me and them? And, and it gives me a map of the picture of the balance of togetherness and separateness in a relationship. And we want to have a balance of togetherness and separateness. Not too much separateness, too little togetherness. Too much togetherness, too little, uh, too, too much separateness. Um, or... No, not enough separateness. And we want a balance of those two. Togetherness and separateness are, all, are forces that are always at work. And they come also from our family of origin. What you learned and how you internalized togetherness and separateness, which is the ability to be intimate, which is the ability to be yourself. To be yourself is the separateness. To be intimate is to be the togetherness. And that balance you learned back then and are still using today. And so we want to grow that up 
is what we want to do. And so when something happens, for example, uh, I, I think I've used the haircut example in another video. I'm talking to my mother, elderly mother. I'm 60-some at the time. And we're talking and just having a normal conversation. And it's a good conversation we're having. And then she jumps in and says, Oh, Jerry, your hair, it just looks so awful in the back. And my hair will grow long in the back. I don't have much up here, but I have more back here. Your hair just looks so awful in the back. You don't go out like that. That just looks so scraggly. Are you going to get a haircut? I'm going, what? You know, and, you know, and I think by the time you get to be 60 or 60-some, you probably kind of know about haircuts. But she still functioned as a parent rather than as an adult mother. She functioned as a parent mother rather than an adult mother. And so she steps out of that role, and she would do that often. And so I would, I would envision that as here we're talking back and forth. She's talking about her experience. I'm talking about mine. We have a net in between us, and we're playing this tennis game. As soon as she makes the haircut cop, uh, comment, she then that's her jumping over to the net into my side of the tennis court. And she'd like to function as though no net even exists is how she would have liked to have functioned. Well, no, there needs to be a net. Now, it's, per, it's permeable, but we still need that net. And so she jump over here. So then I have a responsibility and a job to go, how do I assist her to get back over to the other side and how I can stay on my side and not jump over to her side and get all in her stuff and angry and upset and punishing, you know, because I don't want to jump over the net to hit her side either. I want to stay on my side. I want her to stay on her side. And so I would say, Mom, that really felt rather awkward, even insulting to some degree, because you were talking about how bad I would look to other people. I don't know that other people even care what I look like. Um, but I, I'm guessing somehow it reflected on her that she'd be a bad parent if I didn't have my hair cut. And they, what they would think about her is how she raised me or something. And so I said, I'd like you to, um, uh, I, I really don't want to talk about my hair or my haircut. And you're free to think whatever you want to think about my hair, to think whatever you want to think about what anybody might think about my hair. You're free to tell everybody here at the nursing home, because she was at the nursing home at the time, that my hair looks terrible. You're free to do that and tell all your friends. You are just not free to tell me. And that's what I ask. And because I felt it was rude and inappropriate. If you notice, that's what Betty would do. That's what Reggie would do. It's not what the little Joanne's child Jerry would do but it's what Betty and Reggie would do so I would ask you not to bring that up again now if she doesn't do it then we have other things that we can do but if you notice I'm wanting to keep her on her side of the net and me on my side of the net and so I think about relationships of where is everybody on the court where am I over on their side, enmeshed, fused with them, absorbing their feelings? Are they over on my side, absorbing? I want the net. I want them over there. I want me over here. And I use that as an, an analogy to know where everybody is on the court that can kind of help me stay calmer. And when she said that, I immediately said, oh, she's on my side of the net again. Excuse me just a second. I need a little protein. <clears throat> She's on my side of the net again. And, and then I'm able to be a little more objective about it. That she's not saying this to really be, beat me down, though she may be, but it, she's doing it because she felt pinged and anxious, and then it came out in the form of my hair and haircut. It's her high anxiety that's the problem. 
it could have been anything. It could have been hair, the color shirt I had. The, it could be anything. And I know the way she grew up, which was very strict, very, uh, you know, very worry about what other people think and believe kind of notion that that's pinging in her. And now she's got to tell me as a 60-year-old man out of her pinging. I... I'm not going to take that personally. I think it's rather insulting and rather rude, but I, I, I'm fine with my hair if it's long. I had already tried two or three times to get a haircut anyway. And so I knew it was time to get a haircut. But she doesn't need to tell me that or inform me that I need to do that. And so um, I want to be able to recognize when someone when someone is being reactive with you, in almost any way, even if it's uh, mean, abusive, traumatic, discounting, in, uh, intr intrusive, I think I said, um, unhappy with you, upset with you, if they are reactive, remember, they're pinging out of their emotional system. What's happening just happens to be a symptom. It's just a symptom of that. And we take it so personally. So if we can learn to not take that so personally, um, well, I'll give you another example. Um, no, I think our, I'm going to use that example in another tool. So sixthly, what about acting neutral? And I call acting neutral, and I definitely mean acting because we don't feel like it. So it's an acting process. I call it holy pretense. We're pretending in a very holy and sacred way and healthy way. We're pretending. And it's that what would Betty do is another way of thinking about how would I act like Betty? How would I act like somebody adult-like? How would I act like a 65-year-old man? Well, what does a 65-year-old man do in this situation? Then I'm trying to get something outside myself and understand myself outside the system. I'm trying to operate outside the emotional um, anx anxious system. So I've told people, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and tell your uh, son that, an adult son, a mother, and that she was upset because the adult son was using drugs as a crazy wife and they're using drugs and they keep the grandkids away from her and it's very painful for her, very painful. And she had been reactive with the son time and time again. And also with the, um, oh, you can see the ocean a little better when I move back out there. But she'd been reactive with her son and, son and daughter-in-law and get upset and pinging all over the place. And I said, I want you to talk with him and I want you to pretend to be calm. Yeah, but Jerry, this is horrible. They keep my grandkids away from me. They, oh, it is. It's awful. I have no doubt. It, I'm not saying it's not awful. I'm saying I want you to pretend to be calm, even whether you feel like it or not. Even if you don't feel calm, calm I want you to act calm. And, but aren't I being fake, Jerry, if I act calm and act this adult way or what would Betty do or that's not how I really feel no I know that's not how you think you really feel um, and then and say well that's not truly how I feel Jerry you're right you are feeling in in a in in the family systems way you are feeling these feelings but they are not truly how you feel. They are your feelings from the system is how you're feeling, and they're not your true feelings. They're system's feelings. I'm just asking you to stop pretending with the system's feelings and pretend with this more adult-like response in which you might share your true feelings uh, in that instance. Um, again, it's systems feelings versus real feelings. Hurt plus reactivity is not real hurt. It's a systems feeling. 
hurt minus reactivity is real hurt and is a true feeling. Reactivity is what causes the problem. And so she then, she's going, well, it seems really fake. And I said, well, I want you to be fake because fake is more the real you than what you've been doing in your reactivity. That's really, really fake. That's the system making you do it. And the system that's pinging all in between you and your son, and she and her son were enmeshed. Um, and he then keeps him pinging off mom. Mom keeps pinging off him. Is that pinging real? Is that a real relationship? And real themselves? No, that's not real self. Those aren't real selves. That's pinging selves. And people go, well, you're going to ask me to stop that. Then I won't feel real. I know, because real doesn't feel real to you, because your real is used to this other system's feeling real. Because your real's not real. What I'm telling you to do is real, though it's going to feel pretending to you. But actually, that's why it's a holy pretense. You're really being you when you do what Betty would do, when you do what Reggie would do, when you do what Jerry would do, or whoever you use to, to try to borrow their objectivity. Then you're truly more being you, rather than just a victim of the emotional field of the system which is pinging you. That I don't think is real. That's, that's pinging all over the place. That's not the real you. But it feels so real to us because that's what's been normal for us all these years. Seventh. Let me talk about a seventh tool. Hold on just a second. I know this is a long video and not everybody likes long videos. Hey, shut it off anytime you want. Turn it on in the background and listen to it. Listen to portions of it at a time. You don't have to listen to it all at once, but I really wanted to kind of do a workshop here on uh, calmness. Seventh, stop looking for others to calm you down. Stop looking for others to stop your reactivity. And that's what we do all the time. The mom and the son situation, she's looking for her son to act right so she won't react. He's looking for his mom to act differently and change so he won't react. Everybody's looking for everybody else to make them not be reactive. What we have to do is be self-differentiated, which is a practice and a learned thing that I talk a lot about with my clients. To be self-differentiated, we work on the self to reduce our reactivity and not look for other people and how they relate to us to make us happy because it won't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, it might seem to work at times, but it won't work permanently. Stop looking for external things to resolve your uncomfortable feelings. You know you have buttons that gets pushed, right? Do you know what most of us do? We try to make other people not push our buttons rather than deactivate our buttons. Like when, uh, I think I had um, the, I know there was, a, well, if we have, if you have a button, let's say take Brian, the example that I used with the couple. He has an I am worthless button. And if she says, well, I'm not sure if I want to go four days or two days. I know I agreed with you to do two, but I'm just having this conflict inside. I'm not saying we're going to go to four, but I'm just, that was enough to push his I am, not, I am worthless button. Now that button gets pushed and he is off and running. Now, we can either change Serena so she never pushes that button. Good luck doing that. That can be a real task. How do you do that? Do you walk on eggshells? Do you make sure life never happens? What, 
What do you do? Or we can teach Brian to deactivate that button by having him work on his worthlessness issue that's still at work in him from his family of origin. That's going to help deactivate that. And then she can say, you know, I'm not sure whether I want four days or two days. And he can say, Serena, it would mean a lot to me if we could stick with the two days versus four days. I know your sister was very persuasive and angry and insistent. And I know that you're still dealing with your connection with your family. I understand that. But my preference, speaking for Brian, he's staying focused on himself, is that I'd like to still do the two days if you would be willing to do that. Well, yeah, honey. Yeah, I'll do that. Now we have a totally different conversation rather than everybody's buttons getting pushed. So work on deactivating your own buttons. But if my wife would just love me and show me affection, I wouldn't be so agitated or anxious or angry or upset. No. If mom would only accept me and my family respect me, I wouldn't feel so worthless and full of shame and guilt. No. Neither of those are true. And neither of those are going to work. Because they're going to be your family who they are. And they're probably, more than likely, not going to change. So you have to deal with your feelings of need for love or affection, respect, worthlessness, and worthiness, and reducing shame and guilt. You're going to have to work on those rather than waiting on them to give them to you so your button doesn't get pushed. You're, you'll wait forever. No adult and no adult relationship can resolve unresolved childhood or family of origin issues, nor can they resolve dependency needs. Only you can. And I have people all the time looking to resolve those childhood issues through their relationships, through marriage, through their relationships with their family, through their relationships at work, through their relationships with the church, through... And they always get frustrated and it doesn't work because it doesn't work. And it's going to raise a lot more anxiety if we continue to try to look to other relationships to fix those problems. The system caused this problem, so now I'm going to the system to get it fixed. No, don't do that. Do this, the system caused the problem, so now I'm going to fix me inside the system to fix it. That's the way to reduce anxiety and reactivity and increase calmness. If you do the first that I described, you're only going to get more blind and more stuck if you do that. Eighth, um, stop these dysfunctional and anxiety-binding behaviors or mechanisms. We'll do all these things to try to fix that system's anxiety. Whenever you're doing these things, and I'm going to mention them here in a minute, uh, whenever you do these things, you're doing them to try to fix the anxiety in the system in you. Avoidance. Cut off. Distancing. Under functioning. Using relationships as a distraction. Over involvement or codependency. Over functioning fixing the problems, worrying. And again, worrying is used to avoid other areas in my life. Oftentimes we worry about things to not focus on other things that we should be worrying about or fixing or addressing. So we worry about our children and, and get all caught up with them because we don't want to deal with the marriage that's not going well. 
So I worry about my kids, worry about, and I go, wait a minute, is that really where your worry belongs? I mean, is that the right direction for it? Absorbing feelings of others, controlling others' reactions and anxiety. And again, leave them on their side of the tennis net. None of these behaviors, I might also put addictions, I can do, there are lots of kinds of distractions, golf, gambling, addictions, work, if we're overworking, then we've got, uh, then you're binding anxiety. If we're over golfing, we're binding anxiety. If we're over shopping, we're binding anxiety. None of these reflect making decisions for the self, but for the system and for the system's anxiety. We want to stop making others the focus of our anxiety. And this is also how it gets passed down through the generations. Because we can become over-focused on our kids and project and over-focus onto them. Then they'll project and over-focus onto their kids. And, and so, we're, so this anxiety managing uh, behavior or mechanism just keeps going on down. Um, <clears throat> And I always take the rule, whatever issues you don't resolve internally and in your, in your relationship and in your system, you pass them on to your kids for them to resolve and to finish up. So the more you can finish up and the more you can resolve, the less bad or unhealthy inheritance you're going to pass on to them. Ninthly, let me get another drink here. It's been a long time. Lower your expectations. We know from the research, if you want to be calmer, if you want to be happier, one of the quickest ways to do it is to lower your expectations. Become more realistic. Our expectations seem as normal to us as this anxiety seems so normal to us. It's just the way, it's the ocean we swim in. It's the water the fish swims in. When you ask the fish, where's the water, they will go, what water? I don't know what you're talking about. Is, is the water cold or warm? What water? Because that's the environment they live in. They don't see it. It's, it's just their subjectivity and objectivity, too, because they're swimming through the water. Our expectations for others and for ourselves and for life seem very normal. All I'm, and now I'm going to be facetious in these statements, all I'm asking is to have my narcissistic avoidant husband talk to me like he cares. Do you think that's an unrealistic expectation? All I'm asking is to have my codependent, anxious, intrusive mother respect my boundaries and treat me like an adult. Real expectation. All I'm asking is for my adult daughter, who is immature, moody, disrespectful, angry, and punishing, to treat me right and to treat me with respect. And then what I do is feed back those expectations. You know your daughter is immature, moody, disrespectful, angry, and punishing. Why are you expecting her to treat you with respect? I'm not saying she shouldn't treat you with respect. I absolutely believe she should. But you're expecting her to. I think what you need to do is to lower your expectation and then work out your relationship with her. Oh, my daughter's not going to change. Okay, now what kind of relationship do you want to have with your daughter? Oh, well, I'll only see her every three months, every six months. Okay, well, that seems a lot more realistic than, hey, you want to meet with her every week and all you do is get punished. That seems rather silly and you're waiting on your daughter to change. 
you know, but Jerry, my narcissistic husband just is so mean. And so, yes, that's what narcissistic husbands do. So I try to help them with their expectations. Another thing I will do <clears throat> is try to help them be realistic because that can help lower our expectations. Um, this one particular woman who came and her husband is narcissistic <clears throat> and, and just a mess, uh, sex, at, sex uh, porn addiction, etc. And um, <clears throat> she was very upset with the marriage and he's very volatile and, and the, um, and for all of their, she'd been with him for 35 years or a very long time. <clears throat> and, and I told her, I said, I think you have seen your husband as normal with a problem. And for these 35 years, that's why you stayed with him. Because you saw him as normal, but with a problem. Now, by the way, their problem started on their honeymoon. And very soon thereafter, she even thought about leaving him. So there were problems going way, way back. But she saw him as normal with a problem. What I try to help people do is, no, they're not normal with a problem. They are abnormal with problems. They are not well. And she's going, oh my gosh, I've always seen it that way. You know, your son is abnormal, not normal with a problem. He has a problem. Your cousin is, he's, they're narcissistic. They're not just a wonderful person with a little narcissism here and there. You know, and again, we tend to view out of our blindness and our observational blindness, we tend to view all these things as, well, it should be normal, but it's just not. No, it's worse than that. It's not normal. You know, like, well, I'm just waiting on mom to kind of accept me and love me. Jerry, it's not normal mom who just is choosing not to love you. She can't do it. She is not well enough to do it. Ooh, that's a reality that's not fun to accept. But it will lower my expectations so I can deal with it in a realistic, more mature way. However, it does cause me to have to give up my fantasies of just like this woman having the husband she's always wanted, having the mother you've always wanted, having the daughter who you could be friends with and enjoy rather than all she does is complain and, and abuse you. And uh, again, these are systems expectations that we've had uh, throughout the system. The system teaches us they're normal, but just have a little problem. Because we've grown up in our family, and our family has seemed normal just with problems. No, your family wasn't just normal with problems. Your family was a mess. You know, so we really need to lower those expectations of what we think we're going to get from them or what we can get from them. But we fear giving up those fantasies and those expectations because we're, again, counting on others to change, meet our needs, to be loved and accepted, and make our lives happier. And, and what am I going to do if I wake up and absolutely realize my mother cannot love me the way I would like her to love me or even in some minimal ways? What am I going to do with that reality? Well, on the one hand, I'm going to grieve it and I'm going to feel sad. And I'm going to have to let it go and it will be painful. On the other hand, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to say, maybe it's my job to find the love for me that I want from me and then as well as from other healthy relationships. And stop going to that well that is dry. We keep going to wells that are dry and trying to get drinks. And I keep telling people, I, I really think you don't want to go there to get that drink because there's no water there. And so we then are now focused on our needs, meeting our needs, and we would see these relationships differently. 
I don't need my mother and I don't need my mother's love to be okay. I need my love for me to be okay. I don't need hers. She's just another human being. She's an adult. Uh, Would it have been nice to have that? Well, of course it would have. I'm not saying we don't want to do that for our children. But once you become an adult, all bets are off. Your family of origin can't meet those needs. Once you become an adult, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, Now, we may get a blessing and they may change and maybe parent will come around and be a much more loving, caring person. That's wonderful. Accept that. But just remember, you don't need it. Not to be happy, not to be fulfilled in yourself. You don't need that. Um, If you're not ready to let these fantasies go then own them and accept you and look for the downsides. Meaning, okay, well, Jerry, I'm not ready to let go that my mother cannot love me like I'd like her to love me. Say that a thousand times and accept it and accept you that that's where you're at. And then also look at if I decided to give up this fantasy, What would be the downsides? What would be a problematic for me if I let mom go and she didn't have to play that role? She didn't have to meet my needs. What would be the downsides? And then work on the downsides. Uh, I think I've got a, a video where I talk more about working on the downsides of those kinds of things. We hold on to the fantasy that if only she or he would acknowledge their problems, weaknesses, limitations, then I could be happy. And this is the changing the other person fantasy. Give up the changing the other person fantasy. You'll be more calm. You'll be happier. Uh, And again, that changing the other person family goes back generations. Changing the other person's fantasy. Uh, we, that was instilled in us in childhood. And our parents had it as well. Ten. Reversals. Uh, reversals can be used to diffuse and self-differentiate and reduce our anxiety and become more calm. Well, what's a reversal? Um let me see here. Uh, yeah, I'll, re- um, reversals are helpful to keep us out of the intense relationship anxiety and enmeshment. Let me give you an example, because it's actually a reversal of the polarity of that system's electricity that's going through the relationship. Mom says to me, well, you don't come and visit me like Susie's kids do. What's, what's our natural response? What do you mean I don't come? Like, I come once a week. I spend this much time. What do you mean that I'm not doing enough? I'm tired of you criticizing me and blah, 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 blah. Defending ourselves, getting reactive. She just pinged me. I just pinged her back. A reversal would sound something like this. Uh, or reversal is an unexpected reversal of the polarity, that, that dynamic of the anxiety flowing through the electronics between us, uh, of the relationship system in an intentional disappointment. It's an intentional disappointment. Well, you don't come to visit me like Susie's kids do, Jerry. Well, Mom, I'm just not a great son. I wish you could have been given a better one. So how's your back pain, Mom? How's that been going? I just reversed the polarity, and now what was operating on me is not operating in me anymore. And I have just become more self-differentiated because I used a self-differentiated breaker that breaks that electronic flow of what's happening in in between us. I always use the example, oftentimes somebody comes into my office and goes, Jerry, I am so mad at you. You are the, you, and I remember years ago, you are the worst therapist in the world. 
you told my wife this, and she told me blah, 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 blah. And I go, well, you're probably right. How can I be of help? What seems to be the problem? I just agreed with them. In a holy pretense way, I just agreed with them. That's intentional codependency, so to speak. It's not really codependent because codependency is automatic reactivity. Intentional is not automatic. I'm intentionally agreeing with you to change the polar polarity. So I go, well, yeah, you, I probably, yeah, you're probably right. Now what do we do? Well, you told my wife, well, did you ask me whether I told your wife those things? I really didn't. I think she used my name to beat you over the head. That isn't what I tell people. So you may want to think about that. And I still may be the worst therapist, but that really doesn't matter. Uh, because internally I know I'm not the worst therapist in the world. Back then, I knew that wasn't the case. It's irrational. So it's okay if I agree with it. I just want to change the polarity of what's happening between us in the defensiveness, the pinging, the system's anxiety within our relationship. That's what I want to change. And uh, doing a reversal is like when you're driving and you're in a skid. What way do you turn the wheel? It's very hard to turn the wheel into the skid versus away from the skid. And a reversal feels like that. Because when somebody says, uh, Jerry, I just don't know why you don't come visit me like uh, Susie's kids do. I want to turn the wheel away from the skid. But what's going to happen is I'm going to run into mom. Instead, I'm going to turn the wheel towards the skid, which will give me more maneuverability to move around mom. And so I'm going to say, well, you know, you're right. You didn't get a great son. Too bad you didn't get a better one. But you know, how's your back pain, mom? Now I've gone into the skid rather than trying to turn away from the skid. And it feels like that. Reversals can be difficult because you're going into the skid. But they always tell you, go drive into the skid, not away from the skid if you want to keep control. That even happened to me last winter. An unexperienced driver, we were going down and she started to skid and she's trying to turn away from her skid. Had she only turned back towards the skid, she could have maneuvered all around and instead she comes over and clips me. Because she just she would have maintained more control of her car. Uh, so we want to reversals are driving into the skid rather than away from the skid. And I've got a video I'm working on called "Stop Defending and Start Differentiating Yourself," because we going away from the skid is defending yourself. Going into the skid is accepting and not caring. Yeah, okay, I'm not the, I'm the worst therapist in the world. Okay, so, and what's your point? You know, I, what am I, I'm going to drive into it rather than try to get away from it. Eleven is reframe to silly. And I've used this on my live broadcast before. <clears throat> I like to use silly and humorous attributions to reduce the impact on me and reduce enmeshment with others and their negativity. For example, just the example I just gave. Somebody comes in the office, they're mad because their wife said all kinds of things that she said I said, which I never did. She said them, I didn't say them. She just wanted to use me as a club to beat her husband with. And so he was mad about that, and then therefore I'm a bad coach or therapist. And... Um, so uh, in reducing um, that enmeshment with others, oh, with the man, so he comes in and says, you're the worst therapist in the world. Do you know what I thought? He just called me a Coca-Cola. And I use the Coca-Cola example. That's Coke that he's saying. How rational and helpful or true is it that I'm a Coke? 
not I've, I've drank one before but I, i'm not a coca-cola but that's how ridiculous his statement is and so i'm if you want me to be a coca-cola okay i'll be a coca-cola though it's crazy uh, you know and so he's just calling me a coca-cola so i don't have to get reactive somebody says well I'm just going to divorce you and I'm going to make your life a living hell because you've been such a horrible wife. I help someone learn. They're just calling you a Coca-Cola. It's irrational. It's untrue. You did 10 times more things in this marriage to make it work. He didn't. Why would you even believe those words he's even saying? It's gobbledygook. No different than, I remember working in inpatient psychiatric practice and we had a uh, schizophrenic uh, young man <clears throat> and when he stopped taking his medication, uh, he would smoke pot, which would cause more problems, and then he was in the inpatient locked unit because he really wasn't very safe and he believed he was a member of the uh, German royal imperial family. Well, obviously, he wasn't. If he then, and he said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to have you arrested and locked up. Should I fear that from him? No. He's just calling me a Coke. He's not a member of the German royal family, and what he's saying is ridiculous. We want to apply that to others who are abusive, toxic, lying, disrespectful, we want to try uh, attribute that silliness to it because it's that silly. And that helps me stay less connected to it and less pinged because I don't want to be pinged. Um, and again, if my friend calls, a friend is hurtful and calls me selfish, if my narcissistic parent tells me I'm no good and doesn't know how they could have ever loved me, that's Coca-Cola talk again. You're, you're just telling me I'm a Coca-Cola. That's it, It's that crazy because it doesn't make sense. Uh, that's uh, vanilla ice cream talking. That's uh, red Kool-Aid. Make it any kind of silly attribution you want, but take the sting out of it because it's ridiculous. Stop being over serious about it. Why would I be over serious with this young man who believes he's a member of the German royal family is going to have me arrested and locked up? Why would I become over serious about that? Well, I wouldn't, and you probably wouldn't either because you'd say, oh, he's not well. But yet we think these people doing these things to us are well. They're not well. That's what we have to come to accept. And so whether they're locked up in an inpatient unit or their abusive narcissistic parent. They're not well. Some of them probably should be locked up in some units. Um, and so we want to attribute things that don't matter. It, it just doesn't matter what you're saying. It's ridiculous stuff. But we take it personally and we absorb it. We want to observe it. I'm going to observe it, make it Coca-Cola, and hopefully help reduce its impact on me. But Jerry, that's silly. Uh, no, believing the parent, the friend, the ex-husband, that's silly. And I'm sane. If you believe what they're saying, you're being silly. They're being silly. When you say, well, Jerry, you're, you're saying I should call it a Coca-Cola? That's so silly. No, no, what's silly is you believing what they're saying. That's what's really crazy and silly. I want to stop doing that. So when comes, someone comes in and says, you're the worst coach in the whole world, Jerry. I go, Coca-Cola. Uh, hmm. That's kind of a silly statement. Uh, why did you, or an ex-husband says, well, you took all my money and you never helped me with the business to this one wife and whatever. And then she feels guilty and ashamed and put down. And I'm going, was that true what he said? No, no, I built the business for him. He was always out of control. Then why do you believe that? And could we make that a Coca-Cola statement? Because he's pretty ridiculous, and he's going to say Coca-Cola things. that don't. He's going to say, and you're a Coca-Cola. 
And if your ex, who's a narcissistic, would call you a Coca-Cola, would you be upset? It'd be hard to be upset if, I, if, he called, if they called me a Coca-Cola. It'd be hard. You're just a Coca-Cola. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you in a week. <laughs> so that's some tools and maybe some helps for you. Uh, this video has gone way on too long. I hope it's been a help to you. Uh, there are more tools that I want to share in the future. Um, and we'll be talking about those on some future videos. I hope you'll contact me at uh, www.jerrywiserelationshipsystems.com. You can find me at Jerry Wise Relationship Systems on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, my email and phone ad uh, email address and phone numbers on the uh, uh, description below the video. And um, I thought maybe those of you who want to hang on for a little more, hold on just a second. Since we're talking about calmness, let me see if I can, oh, I might not be able to reverse that, but I could maybe do this. Maybe I can help you with... Since I can't reverse the camera, I'm not sure exactly what you're seeing, but I want you to see some beautiful area out here and the Pacific Ocean. And there's San Pedro over there. This is a wonderful experience here, rather paradise. In fact, I might even do a video so you can calm down to the video and the view. I want to tell you, uh, you know, how much I appreciate you, you all watching and being fans of mine and, and you've been very loyal and helpful and I hope you'll continue to follow my videos uh, and I hope you enjoyed the video today and Hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll be talking real soon. Take care. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.